trying to balance things out. So uh, we're three weeks in there. First week was about marriage and talked about balancing out your marriage. Last week I was talking to my singles. I don't know what I said like, to them last week because for some reason none of them are here today. What happened? What did I say? They're all... I guess I better be careful. <laughs> no, I kind of know where they are. I'm going to talk about them again today. So today I'm going to talk about children and I'm going to talk a little bit about child rearing. Aren't kids really, really funny? I mean, you got the little kid. Has this ever happened to you? They're sitting there and they're sitting there in the back seat. And you know, they're two, three years old and they take off singing that song. I love you, mom and daddy. I love you, mom and daddy. And you turn around and you look at them and go, oh, isn't that cute? We love you too. Then they break out again. We love you, mommy and daddy. And then about 40 times into the song, I love you, mommy and daddy. You're ready to pull your hair out like gush. <laughs> right? It just drive you nuts. But they love you. Also, I wanted to tell you too, you know, if you go through the bathroom, and you got little kids, and you don't lock the door, when they come busting in on you, that's your fault. Because you know you got to lock the door when you go in there. Because they're going to come in at the worst possible time. Or is it just me? That's what happens, right? They come in at the worst possible time, and they want to have a conversation with you. You want them to get out, and they want to talk. But it actually is your fault because you didn't lock the door. So, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today, what brings me here, and what some of my qualifications are that bring me here today talking. First of all, I am a father myself, as most of you know, we have three kids. My grandfather now, seven of them, of the kids as well. I'm a father, I'm a pastor, which means I read and study the Bible, so I have some ideas of what the Bible is telling us about kids and how they should be reared. I'm an educator, I don't know, 35, 40, I don't know, a long time, 35 years or so. I've got a bachelor's in that stuff. I've got a master's in early childhood development and that kind of stuff. And I also consider myself a behavioral scientist, meaning I watch kids, I watch people, I watch you, and I'm watching and always have watched people with intent to try to learn behaviors and why people act the way that they act. So anything that I'm going to be saying to you today about that stuff, that's the experiences that I'm drawn on that's causing me to say it. So you may agree with some of it, you may not, but I'm definitely going to be trying to help you out with some of the stuff. So this probably is not going to be one of them pastor hooping and hollering and preaching here, because I'm going to be trying to get some information out to you uh, based on my experience and telling you what the Bible has to say about some of those things in child rearing. Now one thing we know about child rearing is if you don't have any children, you are still somebody's child. And so because you are somebody's child, then you probably have some experiences in, at least, the very least, being raised as a child yourself. So I may say something today that will give you some insight as to why your relationship is the way it is or what is going on with your relationship with your parent. And hopefully, uh, you'll learn something. I'm going to do that in several ways. I'm going to uh, use what I'm calling Pastor Ken's quips. Everybody say quips. Quips. No, everybody didn't say that. Everybody say quips. Quips. Here it comes. Pastor Kim's quip. You go ahead and put that up there, Noah. My first one is this. Children are not your friend. They are your child, so we need to stop trying to be their friend. Because we do have that happen. Occasionally, parents want to be more the kid's friend than they want to be the parent. And the parent kids don't need another friend. They need parents. Now, they go through times periods. All kids go through, I'm all alone and I haven't got no friends. That's really when they need you to be the parent. Because when you try to be the friend and the parent, it just does nothing but confuse them. Remember back in the 70s, 80s, whenever it was, and people were, I don't know if they still do that, letting their kids call them by their first name? Like, hey, Bob. That's 
that's her dad. Yeah, well, I like one. I want him to call me Bob because we're. Well, you really are not. You really probably are just kind of confusing the kid. Because when they need you to be the parent, are you the parent? Are they looking at you as the parent? Are they looking at you as the friend? It's confusing. And it's confusing for you as well. Children are not your equal, and they never will be, and they never should be. They're not. You always should have something going on that's a little bit smarter and a little bit different than them. I mean, and they're just not your equal. They're, you're the parent or you're the child. Now, I could be talking to the adult as well, right? Because as you grow up and you become an adult, then somehow you cross over and forget that your parent is your parent. But you have to remember that they are your parent, and they're not your equal. If they're your parent, and I'm going to get into some of this in just a minute, about honoring and obeying and some of the things that the Bible says about it to help us with our relationship with our parents. But there is a position that we have to understand. And if they are your parent, then they really are never your equal. And I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how old they are. Because they're going to be older than you, and therefore in... Uh, because of that position, there should be some honoring that's going on. The last one that's up there is no adult likes a smart out kid no matter what their age is. Amen. Thank you. I mean, nobody thinks that's cute. There's some little three or four or five or eight or nine. Or, so I get to the teenagers. And there they are talking about being smart with their parents. You go get it. Or whatever. No other adult sits back and goes, oh, isn't that cute? That is so cute, them talking back to their mom and dad like that. No, no adult does that. Everybody sits back and they probably are looking at the adult and probably going, I wonder what's up with that. For the kids to be talking to them like that. But I have to tell you that I use the example of the younger ones, but it still isn't cute if the adult is 30 or 40 and the parent is 50 or 60. It still isn't cute. It still sounds the same way. That when if we're talking to our parent and we're being smart out of it and doing the same stuff to them and we're 35 or 40, it's as unattractive as the two or three year old that does it to the ones who are standing around listening. It is. That part of it doesn't change. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 11, even a child makes himself known by his acts by whether his conduct is pure and upright. We always, as someone's child, are going to be known by our conduct and what we're doing and what we're saying with our hands. That's pretty much what that's saying. Number one, and you know, kids don't need another friend. They need a parent. That's what they need. Children, next set of quips, are children need discipline, period. Punishment should fit the crime. Children need discipline. They seek it out. They seek it out. And you know when they need discipline? Long about the time they become mobile. Right? That's when they start to need it. So when they get up and they start crawling around, they need discipline because if you don't discipline them, you don't talk to them, you don't watch them, you know they'll stick their fingers, their hands in their mouth, and they write in the, know, the socket or stick something in there. So about the time they become mobile, they become they need discipline. And certainly when they start to acquire the language, then they need discipline because they are watching us as adults and, you know, whatever it is we say, they'll say. So when something isn't going right, they don't understand their position. So if something is going not going right, and if they've heard us say, you can't talk to me like that, they'll go, you can't talk to me like that. We do a little video, two-year-old, three-year-old talk. You can't talk to me like that. Because they learned it, and they learned it from up. And they don't understand their position that you're the child and I'm the adult. And so this, this thing we got going on is not equal. And they need to be disciplined. Now, we also discipline kids, but the punishment needs to fit the crime, especially when they get older. You know, they get older and like, you're grounded for life. Yeah, they're not going to be grounded for life. You, give me that phone. You can't have that phone for a year. 
Listen, with discipline, you never want to discipline a kid to punish yourself. I'm going to take your car, and what if you take their phone for a year? Now you can't communicate with them, right? And you need to be able to communicate with them. How are you going to communicate with them if you got their phone for two months? How are you going to, if you take their car away, now you got to drive them around? So you got to be careful with your discipline and how you punish and whatever that you don't punish yourself so bad, and the punishment needs to fit the crime. What I like to do is involve them in the punishment. So, you broke one of the rules, right? Yeah. So, what should we do? You tell me, because you're the ultimate thing to judge and think that the sentence isn't too light, right? If it's too light, you can know, oh, no, I don't think that's enough. So, the punishment definitely means to fit the crime. Children need consistency in expectation. When the parents don't agree on the punishment that the kids do, the kids invariably will get in between and use you both like old dirty rags. If the parent, I'll say that again. If the parents don't agree on any type of discipline, the kids will pick up on it and they will use the both of you like an old, dirty rag. They will go to the one and pitch you against each other. And parents have to agree on discipline, and the discipline needs to be consistent, because some people are not consistent. They will do something and get punished for it one time and not get punished for it, and the next time they get punished for it, and they're like, I did that before, and I didn't get in trouble. So consistency is important. I remember uh, when our son, who uh, plays basketball, he played basketball, he went to college on a basketball scholarship, but I remember when he was, I want to say he was in the sixth grade or the seventh grade, I don't remember which, and like, listen, all you kids, really, your number one thing, all you really have to do is go to school and get good grades. Anybody ever have that conversation with your teenagers? All you have to do, you don't have anything else to do except for study and get the grades. So if you want to play basketball, you got to come through the door with some grades. And if you don't come through the door with the grades, you're not going to play basketball. Well, I was his basketball coach, and we were like undefeated at the time. And he was my guy, right? That boy came through the door with some old jacked up grades. I look at those grades, and the wife and I, it's like painful. They're like, okay, come on in, son. You're done. Huh? Yeah, you're not playing basketball. You're done for the rest of the season. And not only that, I said, but you're going to come to practice, and you're going to come to the game, and you're going to sit right there by me in your street clothes. Because he came through the door with those grades. And boy, I'll tell you, it's painful. For him and for me, because that's when the sun is sitting there. Well, they're out there balling. We won the championship and jumped around the trophy. He's sitting there. Guess what? I never had any more problems with my son his entire basketball career with grades after that. He learned it in the sixth grade. So when he got to high school, he played all four years and was getting the grades consistently. So, yeah. Children should not live one single day without the knowledge that you love them. See, the problem is we give too much punishment and not enough love, or we give too much love and not enough punishment, and it needs to be a nice mixture of the two. They need to be a balance, some sort of balance between the punishment and the love. Because if you love them, then it's going to oversee you. It's going to be more important to them than the punishment that they're getting. Because is there anyone sitting out there today whose parent punished them and you thought they was all wrong and now you're sitting there going, they were right. I don't get too many in this. Well, I know I, I bet my parents were punishing me and I look back now and I am my dad. I am him. And what he was saying and what they were saying was right. I just didn't get it. Now, I can go through it with all those psychological terms with you, left brain, right brain, wrong, blah, 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 right, all of that stuff. But the truth of the matter is there are developmental stages, and they just don't do things correctly in certain developmental stages.
stages, but you do. Mark, whoops, number two. Parents have a primary responsibility for, for uh, providing biblical training. Check it out. Mark chapter 10. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for such, to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. And they were bringing children, they, the parents, were bringing their children to Jesus, there's what we're supposed to be doing. We, as the parents, are supposed to be bringing our children to Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Certainly, you can bring them in here, and they can be back there in children's church. They can be in vacation Bible study. They can be at church camp. They can do all of that other stuff. But their primary word, place they're going to learn about Jesus is from you. And they're going to learn from you, not necessarily what you're saying to them, but what you're doing with your lifestyle. That's going to be their number one indicator of who Jesus is to you, who God is to you, is going to be your life. Everybody say, my life. My life. Your life is going to say infinitely more, way, way more than anything else that you say to them. What else do we see here? Jesus is the parent's responsibility but we also see here that adults can hinder kids from coming to, to Christ. You can hinder. Because he said that, no, don't hinder them. It says here Jesus was indignant about it. And then the last thing it says here is he took them once Jesus got them. And what did he do? He blessed them. So if you want your child to be blessed by Jesus, then you need to bring them. You just need to bring them. You need to do your part, and you should be studying the Word in the house, in the yard, in the car. Because they're going to take your example. It is the parent's responsibility to bring the kids to Jesus. My next set of quits, my last one. Children's privacy in your house should be limited. First of all, it's your house. They think it's their house. They, they think it's... Certainly the refrigerator they think is for them, right? I mean, they'd be tearing the food and stuff up, right? And running up the electricity bill and all that stuff. But don't they have a place in their, in the house where they think is theirs? This is my room. Right? Or you might even say, go to your room. So we tell them that earlier. We give them time out, right? Time out. When we say time out, what do we say? Go to your room. So we kind of teach them early on that they have a place which is called their room. So then when they get older, as teenagers and stuff, then they use that terminology back at you. And they say, stay out of my room, usually, is what they're saying. But the truth of the matter is, is it really their room? Everybody say no. no. Oh, it's not their room. You know whose room it is? Your room. you just letting them use it. Yep. Am I right? Okay, you don't think I'm right. All right. So, <laughs> so, so if... They are in their room, and they get mad, and they punch holes in the wall, kick holes, paint the room black with a bunch of other whatever all over it. And when you move out and the manager comes over, and they're talking to you about your deposit, are they going to go to the kid and go, listen, whose room was that? They got messed up in the hole in it. Are they going to come to you and go, hey. And even the law is mixed up in that nowadays because kids are doing stuff. Right? Parents let them have their room, and they go in their room, and they're doing stuff in their room, and then they're what they did in their room somehow ends out in the public, and the police get a hold of it, and the first thing they'll say is, we're going to search, and we're going to find out. And if the parents are responsible and didn't know what the kid was doing, you all heard that before? So they don't have a room. I know the kids in here is like eight months. They technically don't have the room. You're responsible for the room. And I think there's some challenges, I know there are, that some of us didn't have when we were growing up, right? And it's called a computer. Now, here's my opinion about that. In my opinion, 
There is nothing in the world that would cause me to put a computer in my child's room and go through the internet. It's not happening. I have some real trepidations about adults having that. But I certainly am not going to bring the internet and all that it contains into an unsupervised child's room. It just, it just, the phone, well, we have to work with that. No. But a computer? Mm -hmm. The computer is going to be in a neutral place, and it's going to be someplace. And listen, I'm a teacher. I give, I'm giving them assignments all the time. Go to your computer, research it. Da, 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 da. So they need one. I'm not saying that. They definitely need one. I'm going to even go further with you that than this. Actually, I don't believe anyone should have a computer in a private place unless the computer is sitting where anybody who walks in behind you can see what's on the screen. If I have a computer screen here and the door is there, that's what I'm saying is wrong. The computer screen needs to be here. That way, anybody who walks in the room can see what you're doing. Why not? What are you doing on the computer you don't want somebody to see? So if the door is there, the computer and the screen need to be right there. And the people you all know, if somebody minimizes something, when they see you come, something's up. <laughs> right? I'm sitting here working like that. I see you and you need to minimize it or close something out. Why? What am I doing? Especially if it isn't somebody's birthday or something. Maybe. Is everybody in present? You just... Simple. Make it easy on yourself. That takes away a whole bunch of temptation to everybody. Who feels you like, hey, I don't know who's in the house. Well, what are you doing? Did you know rights and rules go together? You don't follow the rules, you lose your rights. Tell your kid that. I mean, they sort of already get it. Your rights and the rules go together. You're not acting right, you're going to lose your right. You're going to lose your privileges. If you don't discipline them, correct them, society will. So the choice is either you correct them or we will correct them. I can't tell you how many times people, parents will come into open house uh, in my classroom and they'd be talking about their child and they'd be going, well, so how's little Johnny doing? Well, he's doing great. And you see the look on the face. Really? I wasn't expecting that answer. Like, well, what happens when you tell him to do something that he doesn't want to do? I said, he does it anyway. Really? Yeah. Well, how do you get him to do that? I'm the teacher, and I told him to do it, so he didn't really have a choice. Hmm, you're the parent, you tell them to do something, they really don't have a choice. If you really get down to it, because you got the whole power and everything behind you. you got to have the power, and you got to understand what your power is. And if I tell them to do something, I've got 30 kids running around the room, I don't have time for one of them who doesn't want to act, right? you got two or three kids running around, you don't have time. You have to discipline and correct them and change. Correct them. Because if you don't and they get out of control, well, you know, like I said, I'm going to. The teachers are going to. If that doesn't work, guess what? If you're going to get a referral and the principal and whatever is necessary, that's what's going to happen until they get themselves in line. I've never had to call the principal and they end up having to call the police to take some kid out, but they would. If they need to, they would do that. So, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So if we teach them, we discipline them, we train them, we do all of those things, then we don't have to have society come along and do that balance. Children and your family. Your examples are infinitely more powerful than your words, which I said a minute ago. That's number three in your notes. Isaiah 54 and 13 says this, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Wait a minute. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. But wait a minute. If we're not teaching them the Lord's way, then we don't get any peace. That's kind of what I'm getting out of that. Some of us, don't have any peace with our children because we don't have any peace. We want them to be peaceful and to grow up peaceful, and we're not peaceful. Hmm. 
If we want them to be godly children and godly people, we must be godly first. Then both of us will get some peace. Because then now we won't be sitting up at night worrying about where our teenage child is because we took care of some of that stuff that we bucking up against the system and some of the stuff they were doing when they were younger. And now all of us can have some peace because when they get mobile, and Rock's talking about, when you know they start crawling, and then they walk, then they run, and they drive. They drive. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Now listen, when God promises something, he could not carry out his promises no matter what you think. And there's something there with a promise. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Let me break that down for you, because we know that the scriptures come to us in Greek and Hebrew and Latin and some other things. So in a Jewish boy's life, they actually became a man at age 13. They call that a bar mitzvah, all right? A girl, that happens with them in Jewish culture at age 12, a bath mitzvah, Roman culture 14, and in Greek culture 18. So when this is talking about children obey your, ch your parents in the Lord, they're talking about kids who haven't reached the age of what I call understanding. Let me break this down for you. We had some babies up here about a month ago, and we dedicated the babies. Was anyone here for that service? Amen. And the dedication of the babies, if you remember, I was talking to the parents, because the babies don't know what I'm talking about. I was talking to the parents. And while I was talking to the parents, and I said, will you raise the child, will you the grandparents, will you raise the child up Right with the things that I'm talking about right here. That's the way that conversation went. But at some point, and I just gave you the ages in these different cultures, a child comes to realization themselves and can make a decision as to whether they want to choose Christ or choose whatever else it is that they choose. When they reach that age, they are at an age of accountability of knowing right from wrong and able to understand who Jesus is, etc., 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 when they reach that age, they are now accountable, and heaven or hell is theirs to choose. You all with me? So here it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, in the Lord means a Christian family in this particular case. Are you all tracking? So if they are a child and they are under 12, 13, whatever age they come to an age of understanding, which is different for all kids, then when they're in the Christian home, they are supposed to obey their parents and do what they have to say. Now, I don't want to do any drive-by counseling because many of us or many people were raised in a non-Christian home. So are you supposed to obey your parent? Because this is very specific about if your parents are Christians, you ought to obey them. You all tracking with me? So then, right here, we see obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. And there is a promise that goes with it. This is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? You want things to go well with you, and then you want to live a long life? Then you need to obey your parents and honor your parents. You don't obey your parents and honor your parents. We're all are too old now because we're past 12 or 13. But if we didn't all obey our parents and we didn't do honor our parents, then some stuff could go wrong for you. It may not go well. Number four in your notes. You are to obey the parents and adults are to honor their parents. See, Paul in this Ephesians from above, he actually got that out of Exodus. Exodus 20 and 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor. That one right there was telling us this is talking to adults. That is talking to adults. That we are supposed to honor our parents. If you go back in the original language, honor here means to give do wait to <coughs> to respect to esteem and to give merit think about what you're doing 
in what you're saying with your parents, are you doing and what you're saying is it honoring them? Are you giving weight to the fact that they are your parent and they're the ones that had you and they're the ones that raised you? It doesn't say anything about what it is they're saying. Did you know that sometimes the best way that you can honor a parent is just to just walk out? No, I love your mom and dad, but I don't. Because if you stay, you know honor is going. But you're about to say something that doesn't, and then just pray. Because God said, I promise you, I promise you, if you obey your parents and you follow these lines, then when you get an adult, you'll understand how to honor them. And you can honor them sometimes by just getting out of Dodge. Listen, I ooh, I gotta go, so I'm gonna hang up in five seconds. So you know I love you, but I'm trying to keep some peace and I'm kinda of sick. So, I love you. And then you pray. Because sometimes honoring as an adult, our father and mother, sometimes it doesn't mean that. But if we understand position in everything that I've been saying so far, we understand our position. Because actually, you understand a lot better than when your child, right? They're just, your child is dishonoring you. You're like, what did they just say to me? You think that changes when you become an adult and you get in your 40s, 50s, and 60s and your child disrespects you when they're in their 20s or 30s? You think you feel any different about it than when they were little? You really don't feel the same way. So honoring our parents is really, really smart. Because as I said before, nobody likes a smart aleck kid. And a smart aleck kid can be 35 and you can be 60, but it's still a smart aleck kid smart off at their parents. Number five, to honor one's parents in many respects is to honor God. You see, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do a series here called Real Talk pretty soon after we're out of the Easter season. Because we live in a time where position means absolutely nothing to people. And it should. We live in a time period when we don't honor certain positions. Parent kids don't honor their parents. People don't recognize certain positions. They think everybody's equal and on the same level. And that's not true because then they'll do the same thing with God. We talked about that when we sang the song, Come to the Altar. Position. What is your position? Why are you coming here? What are we doing? Do we understand that he is God and you just don't walk up on God? Have we read the Bible and seen what happens when someone has an encounter with God or has an encounter with an angel? They fall down on their face. They tremble. Their face gets sunburned. And if we don't understand the position of our parents and are not willing to honor who our parents are, then how can we honor God? That's what that scripture means. We got our positioning and stuff all out of whack. And we need to understand that certain positioning has and is due reverence. If you're, not, if you're dependent on what a parent or anybody is saying for it to you, or not saying to you, to give them respect, you're always going to be a messed up. You are. Because of what they're saying to you? No, that's not it. Sometimes you just have to give them the respect just because. And as I said before, sometimes the respect comes with just, you say, different. Just, I'm gone. Right? Because I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to honor you right now because of what you said and the way I received it. Just making sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. I can remember my parents who were pretty strict, I thought, by all accounts, who were pretty strict. But I remember growing up in the church, and I've given my testimony before. I don't know anything other than that. But ever since I can remember, we were in the church. And, I mean, real church. I'm talking about two and a half, three hours every Sunday. From start to a Baptist church. Some of you have been there, right? And so my parents were raised in the church, and I was raised in a Christian household. 
But that's what I'm telling you. If I give this mic to some of these kids and they start telling what's going on in your household, you don't want men, you don't want to, him to cut the mute that mute it. Because if they start telling what's happening in your house behind the closed door when we don't have a good Christian face on and stuff that we have around here, we all would be embarrassed. Every single one of us. So in my household, I'm having to go to church. I'm learning about Jesus, and I'm learning about all this stuff. And then back at the house, I'm seeing stuff. I'm going, what? what? That? Something isn't right. And specifically, one of the things that really was sort of getting to me was prejudice. Now, as an adult, in honoring my parents, I've learned. My parents grew up not that far away from the, the era of slavery. Okay? They grew up in the South, they've seen some things, and they've been through some stuff that caused them to be a little bit prejudiced. But as an adult, I kind of figured out, oh, well, that's going on, that's why they're acting that way, is because they grew up in the South, they had to put up with a whole bunch of stuff that I don't have to put up with. So that's why they're like that. But as a kid, I didn't understand that. They were, they were prejudiced and hating on white people on one side, and bringing me to church, loving them with Jesus, love everybody. Wait a minute. Something's not right. But long about in junior high school, I kind of, in high school, I was, became involved in Young Life and some other groups that were, I became active, you know, in civil rights and that type of stuff. But I had already resolved in my mind that what they were saying over there and what Jesus, Jesus was right about. And so as a child, and even in my, when I got to high school, I didn't dishonor my parents in what they were doing. I just wasn't thinking like that. I'm thinking like what I'm seeing right here now. See, what I'm seeing here right now is I see wise and African American and ability. That's what I see as the kingdom of God. And I figured that out in high school. So what my parents and stuff were saying over there, I love them and I honor them and I cherish them and stuff, but they just were all about that. They're just wrong. Like that. That's how God works. So then I go on and live my life. I got to marry my wife and all that other stuff. And guess what God does in them? Changes them. Changes the whole scenario, the whole prejudice there. They can't be prejudiced. They love the grandbabies too much. Oh, they're going to be prejudiced. They love my wife. You should get on me about her. I'm like, why are you treating Linda so crazy? I'm like, wait a minute. You're my parents. They love her so much. And they just flip. Just flip. See how God works? But God was able to work because I honored my, I didn't get in my parents' face. You guys are prejudiced. You hate white people and you're the director the director of it. And we don't act that way in the 20th of it. I'm just going to live my life according to what God is telling me to do and how he wants to live it. And when we did that, and then God pulled them along when it was time. Not me. Him. Parenting, they say, is the toughest job on the planet. Or certainly one of them. Because there's no manual for it. If I could just toss you a manual and go, do this, do this, do this. But there's no manual for it because every individual is different and you got to parent them different. That's why there's no manual for it. Except for this one. Oh, there it is. There's the manual for it. Train up a child in the ways of the Lord, you will not depart from So lean on that. Lean on that. And if you're an adult and you weren't raised right, then it's time for some grace and some forgiveness. And a lot of us can't see it because we just were wounded too bad. Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus and offer grace when you can.